saying it's fair to cut the pay of some public servants because some other people have lost their jobs is a weird version of fair, but it's an even weirder version of economics. Taking $3 billion out of the pay packets of public servants will lead to public servants spending $3 billion less in the local economy, and as a result, unemployment will rise further. And I think sometimes people have an impression of public servants that they all live in Canberra and somehow don't spend their money on the things that everyone spends money on. (laughs) You know, maybe they spend it in special public servant shops or something. But, you know, teachers live all around New South Wales. Nurses live all around New South Wales. Police live all around New South Wales. And those are all public servants and they all spend money in the economy just like everyone else. That's right. G'day and welcome to Follow the Money, the Australian Institute's podcast demystifying the big economic issues in Australia and putting them in plain English. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute, and at the time of recording this on Tuesday, the 2nd of June 2020, The Guardian reports that Australia has 496 active cases of COVID-19, 6,622 recovered cases and a sad 103 deaths. And Australia right now is really at the very beginnings of a global recession, one of the fastest and sharpest downturns in global history. And while recessions are measured in terms of GDP shrinking or growing, most people experience recessions through the lens of their job. Have they kept their job or lost it? Has their income increased or decreased? Can they afford to pay the rent and buy groceries and go to the doctor this week? Or do they have to skip one of those things? In a recession, people stop spending as much and they start saving more. And it's in this climate that the New South Wales government announced a pay freeze for public service workers, affecting around 400,000 public servants. Public sector workers are facing a 12-month pay freeze, leaving them without their scheduled 2.5% pay rise. The spare dollar we have and every dollar we don't have currently, we need to spend in health and obviously also in jobs and job security. Nobody will be forced out of a job in the New South Wales public service. We've been getting lots of verbal praise from the government saying how how much the front-line healthcare workers are doing for the community and and how important our job is, and yet the Treasurer is turning around and saying that uh, we're not worth the pay rise. As a sweetener for losing their standard 2.5% pay rise this year, front-line workers today offered a $1,000 one-off bonus. $1,000 hush money uh, is an insult. How dare she, how dare the Treasurer come out with this pay cut at this time when we should be thanking, sincerely thanking health workers across New South Wales. Of course we want to see stronger wages growth, but stronger wages growth is not something that you see uh, by government edict. It is something uh, that uh, you know, ultimately is achieved uh, through a, a growing economy. Getting everyone back to work is boosting the economy. Um, taking money out of the workers' hands isn't going to boost your economy. So all those nurses and doctors in public hospitals that we've been thanking for their service during the pandemic, all the paramedics that come to your aid in an emergency, and all those teachers that the government demanded go back to work so that parents can go back to work, all of them will see their wages freeze instead of getting a scheduled 2.5% pay increase. Now, on the surface, this may sound reasonable. I mean, everyone's doing it tough at the moment. Some people have lost their jobs entirely. So why shouldn't the public sector tighten its belt too? But Australia Institute research shows it's actually bad economic policy. So to explain how freezing public sector wages will actually cost jobs, not create them, today I'm talking to our Chief Economist at the Australia Institute, Richard Dennis. G'day, Richard. G'day, Eb. So, Richard, before we get into uh, this New South Wales proposal to freeze public sector wage jobs, let's kind of get something straight. Before coronavirus, before the pandemic, wages growth in Australia was the lowest it had been since World War II. So, I mean, we weren't doing crash hot on wages growth in the first place, were we? Oh, well, we weren't, but it's all, as is always the case with economics, there, but it's all about perspective. 
Um, <laughs> for, for 20 years, Australians have been told that wages were too high. For 20 years, we were told that uh, wages were growing too fast and that was the cause of unemployment. Uh, and for 20 years, successive governments have changed industrial relations laws in, in order to put, quote, downward pressure on wages. And in fact, when the coalition was elected in 2013, uh, the, the Tony Abbott's appointment to the employment ministry was Eric Abetz. And, uh, and Eric committed in one of his first speeches to, to deal with the explosion in wages. <laughs> we risk seeing something akin to the wages explosion of the pre-accord era when unsustainable wage growth simply pushed thousands of Australians out of work. You know, let's be clear, we, we've had a policy in Australia to suppress wages growth and it, it worked. It worked a treat. <laughs> it was very successful. It was very successful. And we now have, before the corona crisis, yes, we, we had the lowest wage growth we've ever recorded. And, uh, you know, we're, we're a bit like the dog that finally caught the car. Having spent decades trying to lower the rate of wage growth, we succeeded beyond anyone's wildest expectations. Wage growth was very low. The Reserve Bank was worried about that. Treasury was worried about that. And then we entered this pandemic. So, uh, yeah, low wages growth is a major reason the Australian economy was performing poorly uh, before the crisis. So to me, as a macroeconomist, it's pretty weird to think that people think the solution uh, to a recession is to cut wages. But then again, Erica Betts was trying to control a wages explosion that was entirely invisible in the official data. So, you know, who, who knows what these people know? <laughs> And so just quickly for those of us who don't spend a huge amount of time looking at the macroeconomic <laughs> policies ah, of the government. Come on, hop in, <laughs> the water's warm. <laughs> Why is it that slow wages growth is an economic problem? Uh, look, slow wages growth is a, is an economic problem at the best of times. Um, if we're interested in the well-being of most Australians, well, most Australians' income comes in the form of wages. So low wage growth just means low income growth for the vast majority of Australians. Uh, strong wage growth is also uh, a key driver of productivity growth. When wages get a bit more expensive, employers look for ways to not waste any of their workers' time. So uh, strong wages growth leads to new investments in new technology, new uh, redesign of process. Uh, yeah, high wages growth is not just a sign of a strong economy. It's not just proof that incomes are rising. It also drives the productivity growth that people always say they want. But um, when the economy's tanking like it is at the moment, with mass unemployment, uh, with businesses investing less, uh, with the world buying less of our stuff, what, what causes a recession is a reduction in demand for stuff. If people aren't buying stuff, employers won't make stuff. So what's happening in Australia at the moment is demand is shrinking and it's shrinking fast and that's why firms are laying off workers. Now, if we start cutting the people who haven't lost their jobs wages, so, you know, the, the terrible reality is that in a recession, let's say 10%, maybe 15% of people lose their jobs, those people buy a lot less stuff when they lose their job. But if we go around cutting the wages of everyone that hasn't lost their job, then they have to reduce their spending as well, which actually exacerbates the cycle. So that brings us to the to the New South Wales Treasurer, Dominic Perrottet, saying that the pay freeze in New South Wales has been proposed due to budgetary pressures thanks to the pandemic. And we're all familiar with with those pressures. Obviously, the economy is tanking everywhere around the world, not just in Australia. We've seen those enormous queues at, at Centrelink. So everyone's well aware that things aren't going well and a lot of people are doing it tough. And I'm sure to a lot of people out there, it sounds like it, it makes sense to you know, everything's going wrong, the, the government and everyone else has less money than before, you know, why shouldn't public servants be asked to, uh, you know, uh, accept a little bit of economic pain along with everyone else? 
that's um, kind of the rhetoric, I guess, that we, we hear from some people. But what does the research show will actually happen? Well, <laughs> you know, some some conservative politicians might like not might not like to admit this, but you know, public servants are people too. Uh, <laughs> uh, so in New South Wales, there's around four hundred thousand people work in the public service. Four hundred thousand people doing everything from being teachers and nurses and ambulance workers, as you described, to working in the motor registry, to to, to working in the courts, to you name it. Four hundred thousand humans, Australian citizens working for the New South Wales government. Now, if you go and cut the pay of 400,000 people, those 400,000 people are going to spend less money. They're going to spend less money in the local shops. They're going to spend less money getting haircuts. They're going to spend less money having holidays. They're going to spend less money going out for dinner. So if the New South Wales government succeeds in its plan to spend $3 billion less on its public sector's payroll, then that's $3 billion that won't be spent in the local economy. Now, what causes a recession? A reduction in demand. What's causing the New South Wales government to be in trouble at the moment? A recession. Well, if the government responds to a reduction in demand leading to a reduction in government revenue by cutting government spending on its staff, it's going to make that recession deeper. And guess what? If it makes the recession deeper, government revenue will fall even further. And if it responds to that by cutting wages again, guess what? We make things worse. These cycles are well known in economic theory, they're well known in economic history, and everyone knows that what a Keynesian response to a recession is, is for governments to stop worrying about the size of their budget deficit and focus on the size of their economy, focus on creating demand in their economy. So saying it's fair to cut the pay of some public servants because some other people have lost their jobs is a weird version of fair, but it's an even weirder version of economics. Taking $3 billion out of the pay packets of public servants will lead to public servants spending $3 billion less in the local economy, and as a result, unemployment will rise further. We're all in this together. We've got to make sacrifices to get New South Wales through. The New South Wales Treasurer, Dominic Perrottet, now says he wants to provide a one-off payment of $1,000 in lieu of the salary increase for nurses, police, paramedics, teachers and train crews. That's about half of affected public servants. Um, is is $1,000 once off? Uh, check going to cover the, the difference there? No. I mean, that's why he's offering it. <laughs> I mean, you know, let, let's be clear, they're, they're, they're talking about taking $3 billion out of the economy then uh, by reducing people's pay. Uh, they're now talking about less than a $1 billion in a one-off stimulus payment. Uh, the, the consequence is still the same. If, if the disposable income of public servants falls, then the amount of money that public servants spend will fall and that's going to have an adverse impact on, on the state economy and indeed on the national economy. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, we've got politicians that have been talking Keynesian. They they say the word stimulus uh, a lot, but they're not thinking Keynesian and they're not acting Keynesian. And, you know, what we've now got is the bizarre situation in New South Wales where the government's saying we're going to fund our construction stimulus by cutting spending on something else. Well, you can't fund a fiscal stimulus <laughs> by cutting spending on another part of the economy. It's not stimulus if you're cutting somewhere and spending somewhere else. And as our analysis shows, bizarrely, they're, they're cutting from the kind of spending that creates the most jobs to spend on pouring concrete, uh, which per million dollars spent won't even create as many jobs uh, as will be lost from, from the cuts on public sector wages. Yeah, so just to that uh, research, the Australian Institute's research shows that cutting the pay of public servants and spending more money on capital works will likely lead to a reduction of 1,100 jobs. 
Um, so just explain to me why that is, Richard, and that idea of you know, spending more money on construction compared to public servants' wages, yeah. why that's, you know, a bit of a fantasy. We, we hear a lot about, you know, the government needing to stimulate the economy with spending and we hear a lot about how infrastructure is the kind of be-all and end-all. It's like the ultimate stimulus tool. Uh, well, the, the data suggests otherwise. The Australian Bureau of Statistics publishes an enormous around, uh, amount of data, which is fun if you like going to the ABS website. And anyone can go there and, and with a bit of digging around, you can find what are called the employment multipliers for different kinds of spending. Now, the reason that spending money in different areas of the economy has a different impact on employment is quite obvious. Some forms of economic, economic activity are very labour intensive and some forms of economic activity are very capital intensive. So, for example, imagine you spent a, a million dollars in the aged care sector or a million dollars on arts and entertainment. They're very labour intensive industries. And you end up creating quite a lot of jobs per million dollars spent when you when you spend it on something labour intensive like aged care. But when you spend a million dollars building a new coal mine or a million dollars building a bridge or a tunnel, it's very capital intensive. Capital is just the economist's fancy word for machinery. So when you spend a lot of money on a road, for example, of course you'll create some jobs, but you'll actually spend most of that million dollars on concrete and renting equipment, bulldozers, graders, cranes, drilling equipment, you name it. And most of that capital equipment's actually imported. So when we look at the labour intensity of the construction sector, it, it's actually one of the worst sectors for creating jobs per million dollars spent of all the things you can spend it on. So what we did in our in our latest paper was simply look at the employment multipliers for general consumption spending. So if, if I gave you an extra million dollars, Ebony, I don't know what it is you'd buy, but the ABS tells me on average what you'd buy and the ABS allows us to figure out what the employment effect from that would be. And when you go spend or when all the listeners go and collectively spend a million bucks, uh, we would create almost twice as many jobs as if you spent a million bucks building a bridge or building a road. So mm. this is, you know, this is top secret data. It's hidden on the Australian <laughs> Bureau of Statistics website. Uh, the New South Wales Treasury should know how to find it. And I guess the big picture point is that the shape of government spending matters as much as the size. And what the New South Wales Treasurer is saying is, look, I'm building roads, I must be creating jobs. But actually the New South Wales government is saying, hey, I'm taking money off one group of people who are going to go and spend it. And they're not going to be able to spend it anymore, but I'm going to go spend it over here on roads and bridges. Look at me, I'm creating jobs. Well, we can actually compare those two things, and we have. And I think sometimes people have an impression of public servants that they all live in Canberra and somehow don't spend their money on the things that everyone spends money on. <laughs> and, you know, maybe they spend it in special public servant shops or something, but... <laughs> You know, yeah. teachers live all around New South Wales. Nurses live all around New South Wales. Police live all around New South Wales. And those are all public servants and they all spend money in the economy just like everyone else. That's right. And, uh, you know, the New South Wales government itself um, publishes a nice map and a nice table showing where all the public servants that they employ live. And, yeah, absolutely, they're spread out all around the state. And when the New South Wales government says we're going to spend $3 billion less on the wages of those public servants, well, you can, you can figure out where, uh, where the money's going to be lost. So, you know, we've kindly helped the government with that. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the Hunter Valley uh, will lose $81 million uh, in, in wages and salary. 
um, the uh, the Central West will lose a uh, hundred million dollars around the Illawarra, a hundred and seventeen million dollars. The Southern Highlands will be forty five million dollars worth off. So, yeah, we <laughs> I hate to say it, we know where you live. Uh, <laughs> we, we, you know, it's not some as you said, it's not some abstract thing called public sector wages. It's it's the wages and salaries of the people who work in the motor registry, the people who work in our hospitals, uh, the people who, uh, yeah, the people who drive our ambulances. We know where they live. We know how much they get paid. And in turn, when we take $3 billion out of their pay packets, we know which regions are going to be worse off. You know, we do know that we need to be building things and creating nation-building projects. Is there a big risk here that we're going to see what's happening in New South Wales repeated at the federal level? Uh, look, maybe, um, you know, I, I just think that strains are sort of hardwired into thinking that, you know, if you've got an economic problem that building some infrastructure is the answer. Well, it's not. I mean, we should build the infrastructure we need, whether or not the economy is doing well or doing badly. I mean, Australia's got 25 million people in it. Uh, until the coronavirus hit, we had the fastest population growth in the developed world. Um, of course, we need to build a lot of roads and schools and hospitals and bridges. We had very rapid population growth, over 300,000 people a year. You know, Australia builds historically for the last decade. Australia has been effectively building a city the size of Canberra every 18 months. So if you want to have population growth that fast, you've got to spend a lot of money on infrastructure. You've got to spend a lot of money on infrastructure, whether the economy's booming or whether it's fallen in a hole. So I'm not anti-expenditure on infrastructure by any means, but the economy's now fallen in a hole. The retail sector shed a lot of work, workers, the entertainment and arts industry shed a lot of workers, the tourism industry shed a lot of workers. Does anyone think for a minute that those hundreds of thousands of people that have lost their jobs in retail or entertainment will be working on a, on a road site any time soon? Like, it's simply absurd to suggest that the best way, the best way to create jobs for hundreds of thousands of people that have lost their jobs in retail and tourism and education uh, is to build an extra couple of roads or bridges. If we need roads and bridges, we should build them. But if we want to stimulate demand to create a lot of jobs for the people that we know are losing their jobs right now... Um, construction would seem to be about the dumbest thing you could think of. Well, we might wrap it up there, Richard. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. This has been a special episode of Follow the Money, and we're aiming to bring you shorter but more frequent episodes during the pandemic. So please stay tuned. And if you can, leave us a review on your favourite podcast app because it helps people to find the podcast. You can check out the Australia Institute's Economics of a Pandemic webinar series at our website. And the next event is on Thursday, the 4th of June at 1pm with ACTU Secretary Sally McManus and Dr Jim Stanford, the Director and Economist at the Australia Institute's Centre for Future Work. You can visit tai.org.au forward slash webinars to register. For the latest health information, check health.gov.au or listen to the ABC's excellent Coronacast podcast, which comes out daily. This episode was recorded on Tuesday, the 2nd of June 2020, and things may have changed since recording. We're on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an AUS, and my Twitter handle is ebony underscore Bennett with a double N double T. Richard Dennis is at RDNS underscore TAI. This episode was produced by Jennifer Macy with help from River McCrossan and Jack Walner. And a special thank you to all the journalism students at the University of Wollongong for their production help during this special season of Follow the Money. And remember, please stay one and a half metres away, keep washing those hands, and thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.